So today we are delighted and greatly honored to have with us Ben Okri celebrating the publication of two new books, one titled Every Leaf and Alleluia, and the newly reprinted edition of his classic novel, Astonishing the Gods. Ben Okri is an award-winning poet, novelist, essayist, short story writer, anthologist, aphorist, and playwright. His works have won numerous national and international prizes, including the Booker Prize for Fiction, the Commonwealth Writers Prize, Guardian Fiction Prize, amongst a sizable list of others. His novels include The Famished Road, Songs of Enchantment, and of course, Astonishing the Gods, amongst others. He is the author of numerous collections of poetry, including An African Elegy, Tales of Freedom, and most recently, A Fire in My Head, Poems for the Dawn. He will be joined in conversation today by Ms. Anehi adoro Glanes. Ms. Anehi Glanes is an assistant professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she teaches and researches on African literature, political theory, and literature in social media. She is the founder and editor of Brittle Paper, a leading online platform dedicated to African writing and literary culture. Her current book project is titled Forest Imaginaries, how African Novels Think. She is also writing essays and commentaries about contemporary African literary culture in mainstream publications, such as The Guardian, and Africa is a Country. Please join us now in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Ben Okri and Ms. Anehi Idoro glanes Welcome to City Lights Live. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, for, We're a pleasure. We're a pleasure. For having us and for uh, making the space for us to think about books um, and talk about them. Ben, it's nice to see you. Um, how are you doing? I'm very well. I've been looking forward to this um, because of the wonderful work you've been doing um, and because of your uh, incredible advocacy of, of, our, of our literature, which is kind of growing stronger and more powerful every year. So I was really looking forward to this and this is going to be fun. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Um, we're just trying to stay away from the rabbit cold in uh, the Midwest of America, but aside uh, from that, we're doing okay. Um, congratulations on your two books. That's wonderful. And um, one of them is titled Every Leaf a Hallelujah. And it's a children's book or you know, a book for the child, for the adult who is a child at heart. Um, and it's illustrated by Diana, um, Diana Ejaita. She is an amazing artist. She does a ton of work for the New Yorker as well. Congratulations. And you also have a reissue of um, your book, Astonishing the Gods, which is in some quarters is considered a cult classic. I can't wait to talk about both books with you. We're going to start with um, Every Leaf, a Hallelujah, and then we'll transition with um, into Astonishing the Gods, and then have a little reading from Ben Okri, and then, you know, we'll talk more about the book and eventually open the floor for questions. So Ben, welcome. Um, let's start by talking about the title of this book, Every Leaf, a Hallelujah. And a bit of, of a spoiler, it appears only once in the entire book and it's the very last line of the book. It's a very, very catchy and intriguing title. Tell us about it. Well, um, you, you have to get the emotion of the title um, when you get to the end. Um, and it's, 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 it's designed that way, it's written that way. I've, I, I've, I've often longed for, books where all the energy, all the, all the streams, all the orchestral instruments all come together at the very, very last. I'm, I'm, what I'm aiming for is for the very last full stop, if there's going to be a full stop. Um, but so far, with this one, I've managed for the very last sentence. And that's because um, the, book is, um, the book is a journey um, uh, of a child uh, through, through courage um, and fear. Um, and, and facing something that is very, very great and grave in her community, which is the loss uh, of, of, of the forest, uh, the loss of myth and magic, loss of 
a livelihood in many ways, loss of safety, protection, um, loss of the, the the special spiritual force of of, of, of trees in a, in a in a in a community, and it's it's up to her, this little girl of seven eight, to to somehow save this forest as well as help her mother who is ill, um, and so. Uh, and so at heart, it's, it's, it is really a secret epic for, 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 for children and for, and for the eternal child in us. Um, and the thing about uh, epics is that they, they have to gather. They, they, they sweep through all the big emotions. They sweep through intimate details. And they have to gather to some kind of uh, crescendo of, 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 um, of, of realization, some kind of great beauty, truthful beauty um, at the end. And uh, this, this line, which is a line the girl says when she's made this great discovery, mm -hmm. um, she, she makes her greatest discovery really at the end of her story. Um, and that's why this, the title also had to be the last sentence. I wanted you to know it first. And then when you come to it in the reading, right. you, you, get a, you, get a, you get a double emotion. Um, right. I am intrigued that you keep using um, metaphors of music and sound to describe the form of the book or the movement of the book because that's also going to be something that will be important when we think about astonishing the gods as well sound and music plays an active role in that book as well but um every leaf a hallelujah as you said tells the story of a girl called mangoshi she lives in a village near a forest and at seven she gets to see the horrifying destruction of trees and the forest. And she has to go on this journey. As with many of your characters, her journey is also a riddle in the sense that there is something to be solved, there's something to be grappled with in this journey. And somehow this journey is part of unraveling or grappling with that question. And at the end of this journey, she realizes this, this you know, she's able to kind of unlock all this knowledge through which she, she understands that there is some kind of bond between the survival of the world and the survival of humanity. Now, it's hard not to see how a story like this is relevant in, con in the context of the current um, discourse on ecological crisis and climate change. Now, is this something, is this an issue that you have been thinking about for a while? Because aside from this book, you tackle the same issue in your beautiful film titled Love Let Letter to the Earth that also features your daughter to whom this book is also dedicated. And last year you wrote a short story titled, I think, All and Peace Shall Come or And Peace Shall Return. And, 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 and Peace Shall Return. Shall Return, in which is a kind of, apocalyptic narrative in which the story begins 20,000 years after the world has been engulfed by water. So it appears that this question of planet um, ecological crisis is a, is a running theme in your current thinking. Is this new or is this something that has sort of been bubbling in your mind for a long time? I know it's been in my work since the beginning. Um, um, it's been there since, since Flowers and Shadows. Uh, which I published when I was in my you know, 2021. Um, it's, it's been there, it's there in the landscapes within. Um, you know, it's there in the, the, the early short stories, um, in, Instance at the Shrine and um, Stars of the New Curfew. Um, it's there in the, in the, in the, in the form that um, um, our environment is destroyed by, 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 by fuel consumption, by the by the, the exhaust from from cars the ways in which uh, the, the trees in our neighborhoods gradually disappear the way in which um, uh, rich communities of, of, of forests and and rivers uh, get taken over by ghettos and, and cities it's it's always been there in, in the famished road there's a whole mini fable you could, you could almost call it a, uh, a meta fable about the trees getting up and walking, running, as it were, deeper into, into, into the forest. And that's just another way of saying that we're destroying the trees. Um, I have this way of saying things um, because sometimes if you say things in a very direct way, people just pass it over. They, they, they treat it in the same way they treat the, 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 the real world. But if you, if you say it in another way, it's, it, 
it brings about a question at the back of the mind. And I use that a lot and it's, it's always been there. Um, trees disappearing, uh, rivers becoming streams, becoming very thin threads of water, becoming dry land, becoming nothing. Uh, there's, a, there's a story in um, Stars of the New Curve you call What the Tapster Saw, which is uh, again, a kind of a meta fable um, about, about, about the devastation of, of, of the forest through mining and oil exploration but it's told in a folded kind of way. It appears on the surface to be a, a tutuola narrative kind of thing, but it's not really. I'm just using, I'm using a, an old ancient African form to reveal modern, modern disaster. So it's always been there. It's just that it's only in the last um, five, six, seven years that it's become um, uh, kind of consuming. Um, it's, why, it's, it's what almost like for you. What changed? Why? Why has it become more urgent for you? Well, I began to read. I began to read um, about it. Um, my, my 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 daughter is obsessed with getting rid of plastic. When we go down the canal, she gets out a stick and pulls out plastic from the canal. She, she's 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 a she's a, um, a, a little eco warrior herself, composting every night. Um, you know, children make you think about the future. You look at the details, you read the facts, you know. You know, our, our, half of our topsoil is gone in the last 150 years. Topsoil is what grows, it's what grows the food that we eat, what grows the planet. You know, uh, the, fish in the fish in the seas, uh, they say we've only got about, you know, um, a decade um, or two of fish left. We've destroyed a whole ecosystem of the, of the marine, of the marine universe, of the underwater water universe, I'm not going to say anything about the skies and what, what we've done to the to the to the upper environment. The air that we breathe is constantly poisoning us. Where you know it's the facts are the facts. The facts just keep hitting you, and after a point, you either just keep blocking them out, or one day something happens and you say, I've, I've, I, "I really have to look at this and face this." And when you look at it and face it, it's terrifying. And then you get beyond the terror, and then you try and do something about it yeah. um, because I believe I believe that we can that's why that's why this story is written I mean, it's written not out of paralysis because you can never tell stories out of paralysis um, but it's written out of first of all seeing the terror and looking deep into the human spirit knowing how extraordinary we are because we can turn things around really if we have to we can we can we can we can perform miracles we are a miraculous race it's just how to activate that miraculous right. self. Right. That's, that's the thing. That's, that is a challenge for storytellers now, I feel. Yeah. But why, why children's book? That struck me as fascinating. If you're going to take on this issue head on as clearly and as distinctly as you've done in this particular work, why did you used to sort of begin it by writing a children's book? What is it about? Well, well, it's not really a children's book. It's a book for children of all ages. Um, I always say it's for people between the age of five and 105. <laughs> and I, I met a, someone who was 106 who felt disqualified and I had to apologize. Um, but why, 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 why book for the, for, for, for the child and for the child in us? Because, you know, I'm sorry to say this, Ainehi, but it's, it's we, the adults, who have brought about this problem and who have perpetuated it we are responsible for it we're doing very we're doing nothing about it we're doing very little about it we're continuing um as if as if as if as if there were no problem as if as if you know we're back in the, the, the 18th century when 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 forests were, were forests um and when and when rivers <laughs> bursted with, with, were bursting with 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 fish um and when you drop it, you drop a leaf, you drop a seed on the ground and it sprouts out of natural uh, energy of, of creativity itself and the fertility of the earth. Uh, we're not, we're now in a devastated and decimated um, um, uh, time. And the only way to tell this story really right now is to speak to the young, to speak to the very people who are themselves most responsive to this situation. Um, right now across the world, it's, it's the young, it's, it's, it's people under the age of 20 who are really, really responding because it's their future. They, they, can, they can see that we're leaving them an absolutely devastating legacy. Um, and they've, they have just gone past us and they're going straight for 
um, speaking out and action themselves. And we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. And this is my beginning uh, to compensate for that shame and to be part of this regeneration that we need to effect. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, it wasn't lost on me that the main character in this book is a girl. I mean, you've written spectacularly of child characters, you know, Azara, who is the main character in, um, in The Famish Road is arguably one of the most memorable and iconic child characters in African literature. You know, but this is a girl, this story is a girl. And it, it made me think about Greta Thunberg. It made me think about um, Vanessa Nakati in Uganda. And it also made me think about the film with your daughter, right? The very end of the film where she takes the letter and she begins to address, you know, the viewer directly. I mean, this idea of the young being able to maybe say it or bring a perspective into the problem that adults may not be able to name really struck um, hard to me. Um, and so you're saying that there's something about young people that makes them to be able to perhaps find the language to, to name what this urgency is. Well, the, the, in, the, in the film, uh, the, the letter that my daughter was reading was her own letter, actually. I, I really want to stress that before I get into trouble. Um, <laughs> that was her own letter. That was her own passion. Oh. Um, and um, I had nothing to do with the writing of the letter. Her mother had nothing to do with it. She wrote it herself. It's in her own handwriting. Um, and she, 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 she read the letter with, with some more elaboration at COP26 um, last year. Oh, wow. uh, so, when, so, when, so when you say it, it, it's a girl, it, I began to write the story. I had no plans in my head about what the gender was going to be. I, all I knew was it was going to be a story about trees, a story about forests, a story about Africa. And it was going to be a story um, about childhood. It was going to be a story of sacrifice, of courage, of overcoming fear. Um, and as I began to write it, it, it she just turned up. And I, I think it's no, it's no accident. She's called Mangoshi and my daughter is called Mirabella. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, a lot, a lot of things, a lot of, you know, we don't plan things in writing, but things work underneath you and they work beneath your hands. Sometimes they take your hand over and they do their own work and you're just helpless before its splendor. Um, and I think that's what happened here. And you're absolutely right. It's not that the young have to find a language or, or can find a language. They, they don't have the, um, they don't have the, the, the limitation that experience gives us older people. You know, we, 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 we're constantly uh, negotiating the world. We're constantly saying, oh, you know, come on, it can't be as bad as that. And there's a, there's a rumble going on behind me, you know, in the literary community here. You know, I can hear it. And it really is saying something like, oh, come on, you can't be this serious. You can't really think that the world is, is coming to an end, that things are really as bad as all that. Surely not. And I'm like, well, th that's exactly the kind of attitude that's got us here. And, and that's, 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 that's adults, that's the adult thinking. It's, 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 it's pragmatic and practical in the wrong way. They, 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 see, they, 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 they see too much and they don't actually really see at all, you know? Um, tremendous amount of experience and they're getting it completely wrong. Yeah, it is, it is a crisis, it is dire. It is, it, is, it is hanging over us. We are in the last but one chance saloon <laughs> for the for the for the, for the for the human race we really really are um and the, the, the older you are the more difficult i guess it is I, I suppose it doesn't look cool to be talking about something like this and the young don't give a damn about it. they 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 for them what is cool is the survival of the planet being here and being able to breathe good air and, and swim in beautiful water and walk in a resplendent forest they just want the earth to go on breathing and growing and being amazing that's all they care about that's the coolest thing in the world for them and i'm totally with them um and we we our hearts get sedimented our hearts get thickened with with life and living and we we, we forget to feel and feel the you know feel just feel the simple innocence of of, of the beauty of trees we we, we really do and it's those who feel the wonder of it who care most about preserving it. Um, and it is, it is, it is, this, this is why it had to be a, a childhood story. And I made it as I made, I made, the girl made herself as young as possible. I tried to make her older when I was writing it. I wanted to make her 14, 15, something reasonable and manageable, something that makes sense in the modern world. 
But every time I wrote 14, 15, it went back to seven, eight. It was even younger than that. Seven was my negotiation with good sense. Um, and it's an enormous responsibility for, for a seven, eight-year-old to, to do what a whole community is not looking at and doesn't even realize is that big of a problem. Um, and that's where we are right now. Huge earth, and we're leaving it to the, to, to the very young to be passionate enough to try to save it. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. Thank you. I mean, I just want to to reiterate again that it's a gorgeous book. Um, the illustration oh, yeah. is 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 eye candy. Look at this. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, when I got that, to that, Diana Ejarita did an extraordinary job. She's a very very gifted gifted artist, and she was pregnant with her first child when she oh. when she began when she was doing the illustration. So you can see the sheer fertility and richness yeah. of, yes. of motherhood and wonder mm -hmm. coming out in her in her illustration yeah so. um and can you maybe t tell us a little bit about the collaboration just before we move on to astonishing the gods like what was it like working with her well first of all it was wonderful uh, collaboration is a, a notoriously difficult thing most people are a nightmare to collaborate with they've got egos they've got ideas they're annoying they are you know a pain in the neck you know, but when collaboration works, it's, it's, it's one of the most enchanting um, things that can happen between two, three, four or five people. It's where all minds come together as one to realize a really beautiful project. And uh, the way we, we, we agreed to do it was I, I would I'd write the story and, and then and give it to her. And she asked for some notes. And I said, look, it's, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, uh, we chose her with my publishers, went to a whole list of people and she just won. Um, she just won the the. the invisible competition hands down because of beauty and the, uh, the passion of her work also she brings an african and a european does. tradition does, and yeah. i i love that you can hear matisse and you can also hear the great great african art in her work all at the same time and yet it remains hers and she just went off and she just kept sending us these wonderful um um, 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 um pictures and we just we just kept gasping with delight when they when they when they turned up we didn't there was no censorship there was no suggestion of anything we just said just go with it follow your spirit go where go where your dream takes you and that's exactly what she did it turns out that freedom is the is the, is the most is the most creatively liberating thing it that is. you can offer yeah it is, it is. It's, it, it's a beautiful book um i mean i know that we've been talking about how it explores themes of um um, climate change, ecological crisis, the misuse of the planet and things like that. But is at heart actually a delightful book? I mean, the way Ben personifies these trees, it's so fun and beautiful and um and delightfully childlike. I loved it. Um uh, and, and the trees and the trees talk. You, we may yes, as well tell people. Talk. Yes, they give they, 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 they talk and they have personalities. And they have personalities. Yeah, so yeah. It's, a, it's a lovely book. I encourage everyone to pick it up. When I got it, when it, it arrived in the mail, the first thing I did was to give it to my daughter. And she literally sat on the chair and just read it through. Oh, bless. It. bless. It's, it's bless. a every smart, smart, smart daughter. That's what happened to Mirabella too. She just devoured it. Yeah, yes. and, and, and that speaks to the, the, um, the, the story that it is genuinely engaging and beautiful in addition to being a conduit for children and adults as well to think about you know so, um, um, some you know very important question so I'm going to have us turn to the second book astonishing the gods um, for just a little bit of a background the book was originally published in the UK in 1995 and um, it, it received a, a, um, a lot of acclaim, but one of the more kind of dazzling milestones is that it was named on BBC's 100 books that have shaped the world, something like that. And, um, and it is a special book for many reasons. Now, um, almost 30 years after it was published, we are getting a, a US edition, right? Yes, it's the first first U.S. edition. First the US first edition. the first inverse U.S. edition. Okay, all right. <laughs> so that you know that's that's what I am wanting us to start with. Before then, let me just give you a, 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 a um give the audience a brief idea of what the plot is, and then I'm going to ask about you know this 
inverted title. Um, it tells the story of a man who was born invisible and who, of course, didn't like to be invisible. I don't know who would. And so he waits until he's older and then goes on this journey. He travels for about seven years and then arrives at a seaport, a very strange seaport, and he finds himself in this city. We could think of it as an enchanted city, but then again, everything in Ben's book is enchanted, so it's hard to make those types of distinction. But he's in the city that is described in this very dazzling, intensely sensory manner, and he, you know, encounters all this people, all these figures. He um, he has guides who guide him through the city. Um, they actually cities within a city within a city. So it, it, it's it's a kind of a it's almost like not a brain tease, but it feels almost as if I was reading a Borges story, or it also felt as if I was reading um, Italo Calvino's book about cities. It, it felt very much like that in, in a sense that you are existing in this space where everywhere you turn is a riddle. And this book is, is, is about how he's able to come to terms with the paradox of invisibility that he represents. Um, before we kind of dive into the book, I want to ask you about what you said in the opening of, your, of the current preface to the book. You say that um, the book was written in a, in a Leonardo way, backwards in a mirror. Is this literal or are you being metaphorical? <laughs> Well, when I'm being literal, I'm being metaphorical normally. And when I'm being metaphorical, I'm being literal. I don't really make too much of a terrible distinction between both things. Um, uh, because when you look deeply enough, things turn into things about things. Um, yes, I did write it in verse. I did write it um, back to front um, um, in a mirror. I was trying to, every now and again, I try to um, unscramble um, the, 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 the way I write, it's, it's, um, I often, I often tell the story of how I came to write the family show. People who, people who knew my earlier works and suddenly found that I'd published the family show were a bit appalled, um, because it seemed, it, it seemed like a bit, a, a bit of a monstrosity to go from the person who wrote the flowers and shadows to the person who wrote the family show. But the thing is, uh, every now and again, I try and break my hands is the phrase I use. I, I try and unscramble. I try and on, you know, on, on write myself. I, because, and that's because we fall into habits. Um, I'm a writer who's fascinated by the prospect, by the necessity of seeing clearly. It is, I keep saying, it's one of the most difficult things in the world. You know, if we saw clearly what was right in front of us, half the problems of the world would disappear because we would know how to deal with them. The trouble is we just don't see clearly. We look, but we don't see. Um, and things in front of us, it, it takes enormous uh, presence of mind and of spirit to actually see what is in front of you. Um, and for a writer, we, 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 for, we get into habits of writing, we get into habits of thinking, habits of looking. And after a while, we stop writing ourselves and our hand and our habits do our writing for us. Um, you, can, you can have a whole career, distinguished career where your hand is doing your writing for you and you're not part of that process because your hand has acquired all the skills and habits and all the tropes and all the tricks. Um, you know, it's been doing it for years, so you can just do it, you can fall asleep somewhere else. Uh, and I'm fascinated by the, by, the, by, the, by the necessity of constantly waking myself up um, and seeing what is really in front of one in this world. Um, and so from time to time I do that. And that's, that's one of the things I did with, with, with this book. Um, to just find another way to tell this, so did you know, you, just tell the story. Did you literally stand in front of the mirror and write the story backwards? What do you mean by that? Writing a story backwards. Well, you, uh, I, I know he, you really don't want me to start giving all my secrets. <laughs> no, um, I, I am, I am genuinely in, intrigued. When I read that, I'm like, ah, okay, let me ask him. <laughs> I was, I was worried that you would be the only one who would have the clarity. <laughs> to ask and the nerve and the nerve to ask me that question. Um, 
let's let's just let's just say it is it is a peculiar thing to write backwards in Amara. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. But, it, but it's yeah yeah, and um and 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 it's one of the reasons why you have the title backwards yeah. like that because uh, the, the 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 cover designer who's a wonderful artist called um, Andreas Gerich, um he um he responded to the idea of the island um, as you can see and in the book the idea of the island diminishes to a point of to a point of purity and clarity hmm. and responded by having the title um, backwards now you can imagine my first response was um, um, was um, sympathy for the poor reader who was going to come upon it in a bookshop mm -hmm. um, but when we had the complete design and we looked at it it was completely inevitable it was the only and the most natural way that this book could come into America. It wow. couldn't come in to America with this title the right way around. Because this book, in many ways, runs counter to what appears to be the American ethos, which is the ethos of visibility. Yeah. Whereas here, we're talking about invisibility, but a very special, unique, higher kind of invisibility, one which I believe is at the heart of the regener regeneration of civilizations. Okay. So I, I want us to talk about invisibility because it's, it's the key kind of thematic preoccupation of the text. And in the book, it is presented as a problem. It is clear that it is a very naughty, very complicated question, right? What does it mean to be invisible? How is it that the visible can itself become a kind of invisibility? And how can this higher form of invisibility become the way of breaking off of this um, this obsession with visibility? Well, that's that's that that, that question itself ought to be for a whole symposium. Um, I, I know, but I'll I'll try and compress it for this for the next couple of minutes that we've got. Um, we're obsessed with visibility. Um, the, the 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 long portion of the human history has been about. Uh, making visible, making real, making present, making apparent. Our uh, buildings, our uh, architecture, our uh, societies, our uh, art, our uh, commerce, our uh, business. It's all about making making things, making things visible, making things real. We only believe things when they're visible. We only believe things when we're, when they're real. It's it's, it's it's seated in the language. You know, seeing is believing. I mean, what a strange what a strange phrase when you really come to examine it. Um, uh, but at the same time at the heart of all the great civilizations has been a fascination with invisibility. Um, it's, it's always been there. Why is it that all the great prophets at some point in the Bible, all the great prophets at some point become invisible? They, they become invisible or they ascend into, uh, into, the, into the upper realm. Um, Jesus becomes invisible at one point. He's amongst the disciples and the next minute you can't see him. He's, he's, he's left, he's gone. Um, the, 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 Eastern tales, uh, the Middle Eastern tales, even in Africa, many of our juju men and our herbalists, they are obsessed with the idea of invisibility. This is a story I remember growing up with, where a man has a powder, you have this powder in his hand, you throw it on the floor, boom, the powder comes up and you look, the man's gone, it's disappeared. What's happened? Um, so we're fascinated by it. We're fascinated by people who, they're in the community, they go away. We don't hear about them for a long time. They come back and they become, they become prophets, they become they're transfigured in some way. Invisibility has changed them. So there's these there's this two great themes, one of which has won the upper hand in the last two and a half thousand years of, 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 of modern civilization. The idea of visibility, Rome was driven by it, Greece was driven by it, wars are driven by visibility and all of that. Um, and yet, and yet there is this thing whereby we know that all of the really great things in life, all of the great things in society can't be seen. You know, love is <laughs> invisible. You can ask for evidence of it, but it's easier to fake the evidence than to, than the actual, than to actually be the real thing. Faith is inv invisible, trust, um, courage, you can't see it. Where, where, where does courage, what is courage? Can you put it in my hand so I can see it? All of the great qualities that actually make our worlds our world, they're, they're invisible. Um, so it's as if there's this, this strange uh, contestation 
between that which we celebrate, which is visible, and that which we do not appreciate enough, but which is what gives rise to all that is visible. Mm. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect is, of course, the minute you touch the theme of invisibility, you touch the theme of perceived powerlessness. You talk about invisible people. Right. You talk about you talk about people who are not seen in society. We're obsessed in the in the West with the not being seen. So there's a whole narrative about being visible, being heard, you know, not being uh, ignored. So invisibility is also seen as a kind of powerlessness. We talk about the invisible peoples of India. We talk about certain um, people, uh, the, 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 the Osu, for example, amongst the, the, the Igbos who are invisible in society. Um, and yet, uh, and yet, you know, so there's, there's these layers. Invisibility has got so many layers to it. Um, and I just, wanted to, I just wanted to explode all of these layers. And, I, um, and in, in order to do that, I had to take which, what was for me the most anguished ridden, the most suffering encrusted narrative and ask myself, what do you do with all that suffering? Because at the heart of this book, and this is something all the critics have missed, because of the way I wrote it, I wrote it in an, I wrote it in a very concealed, um, um, folded way. Uh, they've all missed that the heart of it is a tremendous suffering, a suffering so great that you can't, you dare not give it a name. Mm -hmm. And it is out of this suffering that this civilization, that this vision, this idea of a, a new possibility of transcendence for society, for humanity, is out of this suffering that it's come forth. Um, and one of the things I think I'm saying in the book that actually maybe we are still very much in the childhood of the possibilities of the human. I, I really feel that because with all of our idea of what civilization is and what it can do and all the great things we've achieved, gone to the moon and so on and so forth, we've also managed at the same time to bring ourselves to the very brink, the very edge of environmental collapse. So there's something wrong. There's something wrong with, 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 with our civilization. There's something wrong with its with, with, with some of the things that drive it. And it's important to separate what is great in it from what is flawed in it. Um, and I, 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 the, one of the themes of this book is that actually it is suffering that gives us the clarity, the strength, the love to actually begin to, to, begin to dream and envision the kind of society, the kind of human beings we can really really be and we haven't started yet mm. so it's a it's a it's a book about vision wow wow that's 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 um that's well put and and i mean i was thinking about the timing of the book right almost 30 years after it was it was first published it's coming out now right that so what what is it about this moment and i think that your response gets at that right that there is something about our world today in which it's become even much more dependent on some kind of hyper visibility right social media is the universe of visibility it's it's a world yeah. where visibility is now an economy something that we you yeah. know we can um that we use to measure truth that we used to yeah. measure all kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, there are certain things that we are claiming we don't believe in because they are not visible. Climate change, for instance, people will say, well, you know, I don't see it happening. I don't see, you know, it's not present in the same way that somebody is on the yeah. bed dying. So because of that, there's a certain idea that if I can't see it, if I can't see, you know, yeah. climate change happening, then it's not um, um, happening. So that is- a Absolutely. Certain this book is, 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 feels very timely, feels, um, feels um, relevant to our moment. But we have just a little bit of time left. And I know that you were going to read a little passage for us. Are you still up for that? Yes, and very, very quickly, I want to say, to, just to add to the uh, wonderful thing you said about visibility, um, that, um, we, are, we, we have now reached um, uh, the, 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 the limit of what I call the arms race of visibility. For, for us now, visibility has become neurosis. Visibility has become terminal. Visibility has become 
um, a crisis of, of, of our humanity. We, are, we, are, we have driven the thing of visibility so much that we've actually lost, uh, we're beginning to lose a sense of what the simple primal values are of stillness, of love, of seeing, of looking, of listening, just listening to the wind, of listening to our hearts, of listening to one another, we, you know, the thing about visibility is that it, it's, 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 it, it's ego. It's driven by the ego. Mm -hmm. And when the ego drives anything, it tends to drive us either mad or right over the cliff. You should never give the ego that much power. I'm going to read a section nine, chapter nine from the second section. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a passage that, that the people seem to like coming back to, um, I'm quoting. He was surprised to know in a flash, without being told, that banks were places where people deposited or withdrew thoughts of well-being, thoughts of wealth, thoughts of serenity. When people were ill, they went to their banks. When healthy, they went to the hospitals. The hospitals were places of laughter, amusement, and recreation. They were houses of joy. The doctors and nurses were masters of the art of humor, and they all had to be artists of one kind or another. It was a unique feature of the place, but the hospitals had their facades painted by the great masters of art. They were some of the most beautiful and harmonious buildings in the city. Merely looking at them lifted the spirits. The masters of the land believed that sickness should be cured before it became sickness. The healthy were therefore presumed sick. Hell healing was always needed and was considered a necessary part of daily life. Healing was always accompanied by the gentlest music. When healing was required, the sick ones lingered in the presence of great paintings and sat in wards where masterpieces of healing composition played just below the level of hearing. Outdoor activity, sculpting, storytelling, poetry, and laughter were the most preferred forms of treatment and so on. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. Um, the novel does a lot with um, inversions, which is one of the of the of the, um, of the parts that Ben just read. So it, it's it's a it's a philosophical novel. It's um, it's riddled with riddles, um, and it's actually a somber but also delightful read. It's strange, beautiful book. Um, before we go, we have one question. I suppose we may be able to take one question. Um, and someone says, Annabelle says, does the book invisibly reference slave ships? Did you envision a layer where entry into this island was physical death? Ah, uh, um, was it Annabelle? Yes, that's the question. Annab Anna Annabelle, you got really close, but... Um... You just took a slight, slight wrong turn, but you're 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 on you're on the right path. Um, I'm not going to say much more than that. Just to say that you are, you're you're on the right path. But take another turn in. Um, there is a relationship between the suffering I talked about and the necessity of, because you think about it, you know, um, if you're if you're happy and well and everything is well with you, um, well, why would you really be driven to dream? of uh, a much better world than you're living in right now. You have no need to, the world is perfect for you. But um, if your life is fringed with suffering, it is, and you're still here and, you, and you're still living enough to be able to feel the possibility of the beauty of life. I, 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 I feel you are the most qualified to look and to say, what kind of life, what kind of world does one really want to have? Um, how can it be better than it is now? So to the degree of our feeling, the degree of our feeling, our caring about the world is linked 
um, to the degree with which we um, feel it to its greatest depths. Okay, so it's suffering. about it's it's about feeling. It's about it's not just about suffering because there's people who suffer and they don't dream. I really want to I really want to be clear that suffering itself does not give vision. Um, there there has to be a feeling, a rich feeling for the magic of life inside or alongside that suffering. Otherwise, suffering can close you down, can paralyze you, can destroy you, can embitter you, can shrink you. And I've seen suffering shrink people, so they become dehumanized. I'm not romanticizing suffering. I'm just saying that it's one of the preconditions for dreaming a, for, for dreaming a new kind of possibility. And you, you, don't, you don't have to, it, it doesn't have to be very deep suffering. It just has to be a sense of the suffering of life, something that Schopenhauer kept referring to. He kept talking about being about the will of the world as being connected to suffering there's a it's it's there in christianity it's there in all the religions there's this sense that life suffering beauty they're all connected in some ways it's just that we've separated them because we have kind of um delimited um, our feelings we, we just want to see the good things we don't want to also embrace um the many complex shaded layered aspects of life okay thank you ben um we have just one time for one more question or oh, um peter are you ready to go we have about six minutes left oh well, we can take one more yeah so we can take one more okay or, um, or so you can take you can take two or three and com com compress them into one I'll, okay. I'll answer it. I, I think we actually have just one more so it works perfectly great um this question is from anna and it says, um, what challenges did you face writing through the pandemic and how did you overcome it? Also, do you have any advice for new writers? Um, I'll take the second part first. Um, advice for new writers is always very difficult because new, new writers come with their own um, special hunger um, and special difficulty and special blessing for that reason. Um, so all I'll say for new writers is um, write. Right. Love life. Be curious. Um, don't limit yourself. Really, don't limit yourself. Read everything. Don't just read the things that are comfortable to you. You're only as good as the depth and strength of your reading. Finally, you can't be better than your reading. You know, um, if you read dirt, you can't write a masterpiece. I'm sorry. It's not possible. Um, live. Live with passion. Live with wisdom and live with a tiny bit of recklessness <laughs> and write, write every day, right? Even if your hands are falling off. Um, and as for the first part uh, of that question, the pandemic, the pandemic was a blessing and a challenge for most writers because most writers kind of kind of live in a pandemic like situation, at least a lockdown type situation. Um, I know of many writers who didn't want uh, the lockdown to end because it just uh, it gave them the ideal condition um, without the temptation that they face every day. It gave them the ideal condition in which to do the work that, that, that they were doing. And then after about six months, I, I heard from many writers and they got back to me and said, well, this is getting kind of boring. We, we kind of need, we kind of need, we kind of need the world. We need parties. We need travel. We need, you know, we need to go out and listen and observe. Um, so... I think the the, the, the the interesting monotony of 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 of, of lockdown was was a real challenge, but it, it for, for me it, it it was saved by the fact that I like walking and I just walked uh, more than ever before and I discovered the magic of trees. I kind of go to my park, um, um, and and friend friendship friendship was a great savior. Friendship, family, walking, and books. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that's a nice um, point at which to end our conversation. Ben, it was nice to chat with you. Um, good luck with Aine, everything. This book. I know. I know. He. You were wonderful to be in conversation with him. It's really lovely to to to, to see you. You look great, by the way. Bless awesome. you. Thank you, and you yourself. <laughs> Well, this has been such a delight and a pleasure and, and such a rich conversation. I, I, I don't want it to end. Um, so really, Mr. Ben Okri, Ms. Ainihi, Adora Gleans, uh, thank you from the heart for gracing our virtual halls. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a lovely rest. Take care. Bye, Ben. Bless you. Bye. See you all soon someday. <laughs>